Hello everyone and welcome for another video. Today I have some practice questions for you all, so let's get started. Just a quick disclaimer, I have no formal training in education and this video is meant for studying purposes only, just to help you all out and be kind of an aid. These questions are completely made up by me. Um, they are not from anywhere, they're not from any exam or anything like that. So don't expect to see these questions exactly. These are just meant to be study questions that I can kind of help clear some other concepts up through. Okay, let's get started with question number one. So we have a female patient, 34 years old, chief complaint, I want to whiten my teeth. They're not giving you any background and then patient history or current findings. And we have a picture here of the patient's teeth and the question says, what is the mechanism of action of the proposed antibiotic given during childhood which may have caused this presentation? I'm gonna give you a couple seconds here just to think about this question. And um, if you like to have more time with it, go ahead and pause now. Otherwise, we'll be moving on to the answers. Okay, so let's start from the beginning of this question. So they're asking for a mechanism of action for an antibiotic that was given that made the patient's teeth stand like this. So um, if you all are familiar, tetracycline is the antibiotic that they're looking for. And if taken early enough, um, ch in childhood, then it can cause this kind of blue-gray staining on a person's teeth. And if you knew that, that's great. That's just not what they're asking for. So what they're asking for is the mechanism of action of tetracycline. So let's kind of go through it. A says inhibits cell wall synthesis. So this is kind of the um, mechanism of action for all the beta lactams. So if you want to remember all the beta lactams and group them together, then you can remember the mechanism is always having to do with the cell wall. Um, inhibition of the 50S ribosomal subunit. So this is talking about protein synthesis and in particular the macrolide family. So azithro, clarithro, erythro, and clindamycin are the ones that will inhibit the 50S ribosomal subunit with protein synthesis. So that's one. And then C is inhibition of the 30S ribosomal subunit. And the two antibiotics or the two commonly known ones are tetracycline and aminoglycosides that will do that. So that's why the answer, answer choice was C because tetracycline will inhibit the 30S ribosomal subunit. Now on your actual exam, I don't know that they would really go into which one's 50 and which one's 30, but I think it's important to know just the the overarching inhibition of protein synthesis that all the macrolides, clindamycin, tetracycline, aminoglycosides all will do that. So um, that might be something you want to commit to memory. D is inhibition of folic acid synthesis. So sulfonamides are the ones that have to do with folic acid and that pathway. So that's one to know. And then E is block ergosterol synthesis. So right off the bat, I think this is the one that you can maybe get rid of even if you had no idea um, which function it was just because ergosterol is a um, material or compound that fungi make and it's part of their protection just kind of like the cell wall but instead like a membrane so anti um, fungals their mechanism is usually to uh, you know go go against that ergosterol so that you can destroy the fungi so e is something that maybe you could have just eliminated based on the fact that if you knew ergosterol has to do with fungi and they told you that it's an antibiotic. So um, in the next slide here, I've kind of written all the mechanisms for you all with the, um, with the antibiotics that I think are high yield enough to kind of be familiar with. Um, the one that I think is just the most important for dentistry is the first box, which is cell wall synthesis interference. Um, so cephalosporins, amoxicillin, penicillin. So I like to, I made this mnemonic of CAP. And the reason why it's CAP is because a CAP kind of forms a like wall, I guess, or a membrane around your head. So you can think about cell wall synthesis when you think of CAP. So cephalosporin, amoxicillin, and penicillin would all 
fall in that category. The other two boxes I don't think are as important to like have down completely, but it's good to like familiarize with the different mechanisms in case that you do get a question like that. Another thing for cephalosporin, amoxicillin, and penicillin is if you memorize this, then you'll know that um, for allergy questions, uh, cephalosporin is always included. So um, there's a 10% chance you can have a cross allergy to cephalosporins um, if you have a penicillin allergy. So that's another thing to kind of remember there. Okay, moving on to question number two. So what is the best method to address the patient's aesthetic concerns? We have A, at-home bleaching, B, internal bleaching with sodium perborate, C, full coverage crowns and veneers, D, in office bleaching. So I'll give you a couple seconds just to think about it and formulate your answer. You can also pause the video, but we're going to be moving on to the answer. Okay, so C, full coverage, crowns, and veneers. So let's talk about the choices and why they might have not been good answer choices. So something to take note here is just a test-taking strategy. At-home bleaching and in-office bleaching, they're both bleaching externally. So... Um, you know, one's just using a little bit more of a um, solution of the bleach, but both A and D would be forms of external bleaching, and they're both technically could be correct if that was the correct answer. But for that reason, you can kind of cross A and D out since they're both too similar to be the answer here. So that's kind of it. And also just knowing that this is a tetracycline stained um, presentation even if you didn't know that but when looking at this picture you know you see it on every single tooth and it looks kind of deeper to the tooth this doesn't look like something that you know is a little bit of yellowing or anything like that probably bleaching solution at home or in office isn't going to take care of this problem so a and d can be kind of eliminated that way b internal bleaching with sodium perborate so the thing to remember with internal bleaching is that you have to do it on endodontically treated teeth. So I'm assuming this person's every single tooth is not endodontically treated for you to open up the pulp chamber and put bleaching solution into them. So just on that fact alone, you can kind of get rid of that answer because that would be a lot of overtreatment to go and endo treat every single tooth. But Additionally, internal bleaching wouldn't really work with that, this case either because tetracycline um, staining is internal and even though internal bleaching can help with some forms of internal bleaching, this level on every single tooth, it wouldn't be enough to um, you know, fix this problem. So you're left with C really, which is full coverage crowns and veneers. So most of the time when a patient has the staining and they really, you know, that's their chief complaint and they really want that to be gone, then their only option would really be to get some kind of coverage um, or across their teeth to kind of mask that color. So that would be the answer there. And in this next slide, I kind of broke up some of the bleaching things you should know for your exam. So whitening options that a patient has kind of depends on if it's an external or internal um, problem. So external, um, if you have an external stain, you would be applying material on the outside of the tooth and that material, most likely bleach, will help um, eliminate that, you know, whatever junk is built up on the person's tooth. Internal whitening is when there's something wrong with the tooth on the inside. So whether it's a pulp issue or like, for example, tetracycline where the, the, the pigment is actually inside deeper, um, you cannot fix these things with applying bleach on the outside. So you have to do something differently and you're going to apply whitening material on the inside of the tooth, such as in the tooth chamber. So, um, 
you know, when there's a tooth that's been endodontically treated and there's discoloration, then that would be a good option for internal bleaching or whitening um, if it doesn't respond to an external form of bleaching. So that's kind of what they're getting at here. And um, the material that's often used for internal bleaching is sodium perborate. Um, and that's just kind of a fact you might want to know for the exam. So in-office bleaching uses um, sometimes a laser or UV light. At-home bleaching, you know, you have the trays, strips, uh, paste, gels, and they either contain carbamum peroxide or hydrogen peroxide, so CP or HP, and just know that that is different from the one that is used in internal bleaching most often. And then staining types, just kind of to know intrinsic stains, um, these are examples like fluorosis would be, you know, if a child was exposed to too much fluoride, um, tetracycline would be another one of those, um, if they had that as a child and then necrosis, if your pulp died, then sometimes a person's tooth can appear a different color. So these are intrinsic stains and they're very hard to bleach. These do not go away very easily. Sometimes with some of them, internal bleaching will work with others. It will not just kind of like this, the question we had. And um, yeah, so those are the ones that are very hard to get rid of. Extrinsic superficial staining is rather um, simpler, I guess. And the examples would be things like food, um, you know, wine, coffees, things like that, tobacco over time, you know, when you eat food and your teeth get stained, those are more easy to fix with um, some of the at-home options, in-office options, and external bleaching in general. So moving on to question number three. After giving local anesthetic for a crown preparation, the dentist realizes that the needle used was not sterile. The dentist fails to inform the patient of this exposure. Which of the following ethical principles were breached. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple seconds just to kind of formulate your answer and then we'll go over them shortly. And you can always pause because we're going to move right on. Okay, before I even give the answer, just know that this is an ethical type of question and you're going to see ethical questions all throughout your exam. So it's very important to know the different um, terms and then also to know everything pretty much about them. So A is beneficence, which is doing good. So this, you know, this is a dentist doing something of service for a patient, helping them out, community service, you know, things like that, doing good, benefiting a patient. Veracity is referring to truthfulness or telling the truth, um, you know, being honest, things like that. Non-maleficence is referring to doing no harm. So it's kind of like the opposite concept of beneficence or not the opposite. They're very similar, but so do no harm is kind of the essence of that one. Uh, D is justice. So it's kind of being fair and treating every patient um, the same and having the same protocols in hand and not, you know, favoring one or the other. So having kind of a system and being fair with the patients. And E is patient autonomy. So this is most likely about consent and the patient having autonomy to um, you know, choose to do something or choose to do not do something. And then to have autonomy, they have to be given um informed consent. So that's kind of where those two go. So going on to the answers, a lot of people, and when I even read this too, I thought that, you know, it's, you're not telling the patient, um, about the exposure. So it might have to do with veracity and truthfulness. However, this is, the answer should be C, non-maleficent. So, by not telling a patient that they were exposed to something, um, you know, whether you don't know what that needle had on it, that is doing harm to a patient. So you are putting them at harm's risk because they're not going to go in and get tested and, you know, get their blood work and make sure that they don't have anything and take proper steps to potentially, you know, get rid of whatever they might have gotten from this needle. So by not telling them, then you are putting them at harm, which goes against the principle of non-maleficence. In general, ethical questions can be very tricky. And in, you know, surface level reading these words, you think you know what they mean. However, you don't always 
they can sometimes be confusing in that two terms can apply to a scenario just like this one. So I recommend that you read the PDF that I have left for you guys on this slide. It is the ADA um, Code of Ethics. And this PDF kind of just goes over all of these terms. What I recommend before your exam, and you can probably do this like a night, two nights before the exam, go through each little, um, for example, non-maleficence and see what is listed underneath. You don't have to read every single word or anything, but, you know, reading like, for example, um, consultations and referrals are under do no harm. So, for example... If you had a patient and you referred them to a periodontist and, you know, they did, it was for an implant, but after they did that implant, they did a crown and then they decided they wanted to do a cleaning and they wanted to do an exam and, you know, whatever. And then they returned them to you and you find that out. So that could be a, you know, what ethical principle was breached here and it would be non-maleficent. So it's not very, you know, it's not always very obvious. So that's why I recommend going through each of these um, ethical principles and kind of reading what's under them be right before the exam. Okay, so thank you all for watching. I hope you found this helpful um, for your studying. Please leave me any comments or, you know, feedback. I I really, you know, since this is a new channel, I would appreciate that. And let me know if this was even helpful for y'all so that I can make more like it if it was helpful. Um, any feedback is constructive. So go ahead and just leave comments and let me know what to do for the next video. Thank you all again so much for watching and best of luck on your studying.